Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We know that you could be elsewhere. And so we're very humbled that you have spent or you're, you'll spend a few hours or an hour and a half with us this afternoon. This talk is about sustainability in Canada's agri-food system. I'm joined by Tyler McCann of the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute and Dr. Sylvain Chalaboy of the, <laughs> he is a, a, a professor, food professor at uh, Dalhousie University. He's also the senior director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab there at Dalhousie as well. Uh, Tyler is the managing director of the Canadian Agri-Food Policy. And for the next hour and a half, I'll be engaging these two stakeholders in how they see sustainability uh, from their perspective. We know that we're in very challenging times. We're all facing various difficulties, and especially if you're a key stakeholder in Canada's food system, sustainability will appear differently, will be approached differently, and means differently to you. And so I'll start off by asking our panelists to talk about, to talk a little bit about themselves in the context of their role in Canada's food system. And of course, this means their, the job that they occupy and what they're doing on a daily basis to impact uh, the sustainability in our, food, in our food system. And after that, I'll pose a question to each of them. And immediately after that, they will each have a presentation based on their perspective in this area. I'll start off with Tyler. Tyler, do you wanna talk a little bit about your job at the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute. And you can talk about this in the context of things that you have, challenges that you have to deal with on a daily basis in respect to the topic of our discussion today. Thank you very much, Marcia, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to be uh, with everyone today. So uh, as Marcia mentioned, I'm the Managing Director of the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute. We're a national agri-food think tank. Uh, cover a variety of topics uh, related to agriculture and food, look at, at agriculture from the coast to coast. And, and I think something that you'll see uh, in, in the presentation that I walked through, but, but that really, you know, Marsha asked the, kind of the, the challenge. Agriculture and food is, is a complex, interconnected system, uh, and, and it makes it, um, it, it can be a challenge to try and find solutions that really address all that it's being asked to be. And so we, we um, as consumers uh, and in Canada, as uh, the governments, we uh, around the world, we have a lot of expectations for Canada's food system, and finding the, the the policies and approaches that will enable the food system to do all that it's being asked to do is probably the greatest challenge that we, that we deal with every day. But it's a it's a it's a good challenge, and it it creates a lot of a lot of opportunities too. And and maybe just by way of background, so uh, again, I've been with CAPI now for a couple of years. I spent some time uh, in government as a political staffer. I've been a consultant uh, in agriculture, working for corporations, industry associations. Um, my wife and I also have um, a farm uh, in Western Quebec. The cows behind me are is a picture of my own cows. Um, and so uh, agriculture and food is something that's, that's close to me. Um, but uh, over the years, I've had an opportunity just, again, to really appreciate how complex and, and, and different uh, the system can be from coast to coast, and then around the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tyler, for your intervention thus far. Sylvain, you know, I don't want to butcher your last name. We spoke about this before <laughs> <laughs> the camera started rolling. Doesn't matter, so, doesn't so, matter. Right, it's okay. okay. So can you talk a little bit about your role and of course, what the, the, uh, the Agri-Food Analytics Lab there at Dalhousie University is doing in regards to sustainability in our food systems. Yeah, so we're we're here at Dal. Uh, I know some uh, who are listening in have been at Dal before. It's a great university. It's part of the U15 group of universities, uh, research intensive uh, universities. Uh, the lab is a partnership. Uh, was created in partnership with three with four uh, faculties. Uh, uh, computer science, management, um, agriculture, and health as well. And the whole idea of the lab is to basically understand the future of food, essentially. So we look at both ends of the food continuum. We look at several different issues. 
Many of them are topical, really. We look at things that, uh, that do matter to Canadians, like right now, most of the time. And of course, during COVID, we were incredibly busy. Uh, we've, uh, we've actually had the pleasure to work with, uh, with the federal government on several files, including Ag Canada, the CFIA, Health Canada on the Cannabis Act uh, and the Food Guide. Uh, the Auditor General's uh, office uh, on the COVID response uh, as well. We were asked to review uh, the response there. Um, we uh, also have had the pleasure to work with, uh, we are still working with the Bank of Canada in terms of our forecasting for food inflation. That's, that's, that is a big piece of what we do, forecasting, forecasting prices. Uh, in fact, on December 5th, we're producing uh, our 13th uh, price report, which is coming out uh, on December 5th, which is probably our flagship report. Uh, every December, we work with Guelph, the University of Saskatchewan, and, and UBC as well uh, on that report. And uh, uh, provincially, we've actually worked with seven different provinces, most of the time on food security-related projects. Uh, local food is a big one right now. For uh, We're working with uh, Nova Scotia right here, uh, Ontario and Quebec with Alimentos Quebec. <clears throat> so lots of projects that we've done over the last few years with government. Also with the private sector, we have worked with, uh, with grocers. Most of that work is pro bono, but we actually help industry. Uh, we've, we've worked with uh, grocers, processors, uh, farmer groups, uh, all over the country, so it's it's great. So we've actually touched most of most of the nodes within the supply chain. Great, thank you. Back to you, Tyler. And now I do have a specific question to ask you, and I know you will cover this a little bit more when you do your presentation. But what is the most significant challenge facing Canada's supply chain from your perspective? Yeah, you know, so I, I think, and, and my presentation really dives into this, but I think that the issue of sustainability, that's a very uh, big issue, but but I think that, that that one word today is probably the greatest challenge facing our, our food system. And, and, and I think it's because that one word means a lot, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, most of the challenges that we face today uh, grow out of it and grow out of our response to it and grow out of different perspectives again on what sustainability means and and what we should do about it and so i think um, again that, that gets to be at the heart of many of the the issues that are that are affecting our supply chain and again i think sylvain will talk about some of the tensions that are there but um you know it really underpins a lot of that that tension the tension between the consumer and the producer mm -hmm. the tension between uh high value and low value markets that that the tension between local and, and international um, sustainability plays at, at the heart of it all so so i'll dig into that deeper during my my presentation mm -hmm. okay great thank you and to to sylvain what is the role of supply chain to our food system <laughs> the the role of supply chains uh, is it's pretty simple it's the backbone of our economy i mean if we don't have supply chains working well uh, we're in trouble, and, and we and we've seen that uh, on several occasions the last uh, uh, several years. Uh, whether it's due to the pandemic, uh, uh, and I'll talk a lot about, about about some of the things that have happened the last couple of years. But climate change is a big issue as well. I and mean, when we think about sustainability and supply chain resiliency, uh, it's it's a big big issue right now. We've had the pleasure. Speaking of working with the federal government, we had the pleasure to uh, to submit a report to the uh, most recent supply chain task force uh, that was led by Jean Gatuzo, uh, and uh, we were able to uh, provide uh, some input. And I actually thought that the report was really well done, uh, and uh, to to look at some of the issues that we have to address as a country when it comes to supply chain in general. So I'm not going to go through the report, but I thought, I mean, if, if you don't know much about supply chains, I would encourage anyone to read that report uh, about the future of our own uh, logistical network. It was a very, very good report as far as I'm concerned. Okay, great. Thank you. So, of course, in terms of the audience, feel free to pose any questions to the panelists. They welcome your questions. 
So now we'll move on to the presentation part of our discussion for this afternoon. And we'll start off with Tyler, going back to Tyler. <laughs> Tyler, feel free to, to share your screen when you're ready. Right, and so I'm gonna try and flow through this uh, pretty quickly so we can get into a, a discussion um, after. Um, but what I really wanna do is try and, and provide a, a sense of, of what the, the context for sustainability looks like today in agriculture and food. And I'm realizing that I cannot, one second, advance my slide. Um, and so, um, but I think that there's like ground rules that we need to think about when we talk about uh, agriculture and food. Canadian agriculture and food is, is complex. This is a system that has got a lot of different moving parts. Um, and I'm gonna provide a really simple high level perspective. It's a global system. I'm gonna talk a lot about that at the beginning. And it's a system that's dynamic. The things are changing. The environment, people, our knowledge of, of all of it uh, is moving. And, and sustainability in agriculture and food is also complex, global, and dynamic. You know, this, this, this complex between, this relationship between environment, economic, and social sustainability is, is a, a delicate relationship, and it's a hard one to get right. Uh, the environmental sustainable, sustainability impacts of the food system are global. These don't ignore borders. Um, not all food is created equal from a sustainability perspective, and we need to be thinking about that. And again, it's a system that's changing, and, and the, the sustainability of the system in Canada and around the world continues to evolve and, and change. I want to start 10 numbers on food sustainability in, in the world. So first and foremost, demand is going up. Um, you know, lots of debate about by how much and what that means, but Wang and Engen University did uh, a meta-analysis. So their number is about 35 to 56% increase in food demand uh, uh, over the next couple of decades. Um, you know, that's driven in part by population growth, but also by income growth. Good news is, you know, when they also look at the population at risk of, of hunger, that's a number that's that's going down. That's that's hopefully will be a reversal of a trend that we've seen recently, where food insecurity has been going in the wrong direction. But uh, over the long term, that those numbers should start to go back down again. Second set of numbers around the impact. So you know, ag has an impact on the environment, absolutely without a doubt. Um, you know, I look at at 2.6 million acres of cropland around the world that's lost or that uh, of land that's converted into agriculture every year. Look at 70% of the water that's that's taken out of the environment in the world is taken out for agriculture. And we look at about 12% of total emissions, greenhouse gas emissions coming from agriculture. Um, a lot of these trends are going at, in the wrong direction. And, and I'll talk a bit more about that. I think that that, that cropland change is probably the one that gets the least attention out of all of them but really is a really incredibly important number that, that we should talk a lot more about. But the environment also has an impact on agriculture. And so if you look at, at it, it's a kind of a hard thing to do, but if we look at what we expect the impact of climate change to be on agriculture around the world, you know, in Canada, we're looking at one study that said a range of 1.5% to 13% more canola produced. That's again, we've got a warmer climate, we've got more CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, but then you look around the world, a different study talks about potentially 24% less corn produced, but 17% more wheat. And I think it really just underscores that the impact of the environment on agriculture is changing. A big disclosure here, this doesn't take into account climate shocks, these one-off events that are actually happening more often that have a major impact on our, our food system around the world. Um, one of the consequences of that increasing demand and that, that impact on supply is that trade is going to continue to play an increasing role in food security around the world. So uh, OECD project projections are that 22.4% of our calories will be traded across borders in 2029. That's an amount that's going up. One of the things that's also happening, though, is that the number of countries that are suppliers of those cal calories is getting smaller. Um, the two charts, the more complex ones on the, the right here, the top one looks at production. I always think it's important to highlight that if you look at East Asia and Africa, these are major producers, but they're major consumers of what they eat. They're not major traders. They tend to eat what they produce. The major uh, producers that are also major exporters are in North America, South America, and uh, Central, uh, uh, Central Asia and, and Europe. And um, really it's gonna be South America, North America that are the major exporters of food uh, in the future. 
one of the other consequences, and I'm sure Sylvain will talk about this later, food is getting more expensive. Food is getting more expensive at a faster rate. Uh, important to highlight that this isn't just because Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, food has been getting more expensive for, a, for some time now. The last two years have really seen things take off. And, and again, I'm sure Sylvain will talk about all of the factors behind that later. But all of this comes together to create some gaps that the food system is going to have to grapple with in the future. So this is a, a work that was done by the World Resources Institute. They talk about a gap in calories. So we need 7.4 trillion more calories than what we're producing today. We need emissions from agriculture that are 11 megatons smaller uh, than, or 11 gigatons, uh, fewer than what they are today. And we actually need to use effectively 600 million hectares less agricultural land than what our baseline uh, projections say that we would because we need to put that land back into nature. Um, one of the big challenges is that our ag productivity is not keeping pace with what it needs to be. The OECD said earlier this year that if we want to meet the zero hunger sustainable development goal and meet ag's contribution to emission reduction, we need a 28% increase in, in global ag productivity over the next decade. That's three times the rate that it was over the last decade. The unfortunate reality is, is that that is a huge gap and it's a gap that's getting bigger if you look at ag productivity around the world. Um, the other thing that's happening is that investments in agriculture, strategic investments are increasing. And I'd like to highlight the $3 billion that the United States government is spending on their Climate Smart Agriculture Commodities Program. Uh, they are targeting investments across commodities across the United States to one, identify the practices that are going to reduce emissions, but they're gonna boost productivity. And they're gonna try and build the systems that allow markets um, to pay farmers more for those commodities. And so I think it's gonna give US farmers a competitive advantage that's going to work in their favor for the foreseeable future. Um, but at the end of the day, the progress that the global food system is making and meeting its sustainability goals is typically not going in the right direction. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a bunch of international groups released a report on the state of climate action. And I, I think it's important not to confuse climate with sustainability. Sustainability is more complex, but much of what we can do to address climate goals are good for other, um, uh, other goals, other broader sustainability goals as well. Um, but, you know, our ag emissions are heading in the wrong direction. Our crop yields are not uh, improving at the rate that they need to. Our, our meat productivity is not improving at the rate that, that it needs to. We don't have a great sense of data around food, food loss and food waste, but probably not doing what we need to there. And ultimately our diets aren't making the changes that they probably need to make in order to, to deliver a more sustainable food system. And certainly our diets uh, in, in North America um, aren't making the changes that, that need to be, be made. So I work at a policy institute, so I wanna talk briefly about the policy implications of it and the unintended consequences of sustainability policy. One of the things that we saw is that, um, you know, the US China had a trade war um, and it put extra pressure on Brazilian deforestation. And we often don't link things like that together, but, but in this globally connected complex food system, um, when China and the US go to a trade war, there are negative environmental consequences. If China and the US ever went to an actual war, I mean, those, those would be far more significant, but we, we shouldn't underestimate the consequences of, of trade. The second unintended consequence is the renewable, that I'd like to highlight is the renewable diesel directive. You know, we've talked a lot about biofuels and biofuels policy and the impact on, on food prices, but, um, the upcoming demand from the renewable diesel directive driven out of California in particular is going to have uh, a significant impact. So some of the estimates in the United States are that they'll need 40 million more acres of soybeans to meet that demand. They grow 90 million acres of soybeans today. Um, that's all, you know, effectively a 50% increase in soybean production. There's just not enough land in the United States to do it. It's going to put incredible uh, pressure on the veg oil complex. And so we need to understand what that means for this global food system as people try and keep pace. Again, the Renewable Diesel Directive is supposed to be about improving sustainability, about lowering emissions, but it's going to drive food prices up and it's gonna put extra pressure on 
land conversion around the world. Um, there are these also unintended consequences of the EU farm to fork strategy. Many people hold it up as the shining light for the future of a sustainable food system. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, chart on the, or the numbers on the left come from the USDA's Economic Research Service. The chart on the right comes from uh, Wagenagen University, again, underscoring that what the farm to fork strategy is going to do is going to drive production down and prices up. And so we have to understand that the push to a more sustainable food system has consequences, and we need to be thinking more about those consequences as we think about the future of food, food policy and sustainability. Now, I want to touch quickly about the Canadian context here. Canada has made significant progress. Um, the graph at the top looks at externalities in Canadian agriculture. It was drawn out of a CAPI report. 37% improvement in externalities. We're not necessarily adding positive, but we're reducing the negative. We've got improvements uh, in uh, many other measures when you look at that are tracked by Agriculture Canada. So, so generally we've made good progress, um, but we have this reality in Canada where, where again, it's a, we're a big country, a very different system. And so if you look at the net GHG emissions in Western Canada compared to Eastern Canada, Western Canada is about a third of the emissions per hectare that they are in Eastern Canada. And that has a, something to do with farming systems, but it has a lot to do with things that are outside of farmers' control. It has a lot to do with soil moisture. It has a lot to do with soil types. It has a lot to, to do with, with heat in the, in the system. And so, you know, sustainability, we can, we can think a lot about agriculture's impact on the environment again, but, but the environment that agriculture operates in has a tremendous impact on, on it at the end of the day. Um, Canadian agriculture has got an advantage. Uh, our emissions intensity for a variety of different products is better than the world. Again, if you look at canola oil as a feedstock for that re renewable diesel market, we're about one of the one of the best in the world. If you look at our footprint for beef, uh, it's exceptional. But we've got this challenge, and I'll use adoption of no-till seeding uh, as as a prime example. We've done a lot of the easy part, so. We're frozen at about 60% of no acres used in, in no-till in Canada. Our, our emissions from agriculture are typically flat. Our uh, productivity growth is going in the wrong direction. So we've, we were early adopters of a lot of positive practices that have improved our sustainability. Uh, we were ahead of the game, but we've done the easy part. Others are just starting to do the easy part. It gives them a bit of an advantage from a, a global climate uh, policy perspective. But we've got a lot of work that we need to do, and the work that we need to do now is harder than the work that we've done over the last 20 years. And my final number uh, to think about is 4 million. Uh, we have this opportunity in Canada. Climate change is going to open up food production in Canada. If you look at, at uh, soil organic carbon, if you look at, at temperature, if you look at moisture, uh, there was a study that said 4 million extra acres are going to come into production in Canada because of the climate change. One of the things, the other that it said was the other big place that, that that's going to happen is Russia. And, and again, it's important to think about that context. If the world has to rely on Canada or Russia to produce food, if you think about that in the context of what our deputy prime minister has said about uh, the need for, for democracies to work together, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for Canada here, but it's important to think about that in the context of this, this broad dynamic food system that we operate in. So Marsha, I've covered a lot of ground there, uh, hopefully giving people lots of things to think about and look forward to getting into it after. Thank you, Tyler. That was such a, a dynamic talk. I, I have so many questions and it as you're there talking, I'm just here thinking, what is the solution? And is there a solution that works for most of us? There are quite a few questions in the chat and I'd like you, if possible, to address these now before we move on to so like, does that work? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll just spend a few minutes on that. The first question is from Heather. Heather, thank you for your question. And she wants to know, based on your presentation, is there analysis of how much food demand could be met by reducing or eliminating food loss and waste? Yeah, and so I know Sylvain's done some work on this and his lab's done some work on this too, so I may actually get him involved in answering this question. You know, it's important to understand the difference between avoidable food loss and waste and unavoidable food loss and waste. Those are, are two different things. Uh, it certainly plays a, a gap. Again, if you look at the State of Climate Action Report, it talks about uh, reducing food loss and food waste, which are two different things, as important actions that we need to make to improve the sustainability of the food system. 
Um, but I think that, that sometimes people think that, that they themselves can be um, kind of, you know, the only solution. The, the FAO, for example, has said that, you know, we've got enough food that's produced in the world. It's just not going to the right place. We don't have the right systems in place to get it to where it needs to go. Um, but the, the reality is there are uh, some of that food loss and waste is uh, effectively unavoidable. That's, that's part of the system, part of the way that the food system works. And so at, at the end of the day, we still need to deliver these productivity improvements. We still need a more efficient, more productive system in order to get to the sustainability we need at the end of the day. But, but I'd, I'd be curious as to Sylvain's views on, on food loss and waste and the role that it, it plays. Yeah, it's, it's, when it comes to sustainability and, and supply chains, it's, it's probably one of the biggest challenges that we, that we face. Uh, there are mechanisms in place that actually do work, and one of them is Second Harvest. I'm on the board of Second Harvest in Toronto, and we're trying to build a national network. What uh, Second Harvest is doing is phenomenal. I mean, we've basically rescued uh, millions of kilos of food uh over the last uh, several months and and the reason why uh a model like second harvest works as far as i'm concerned is because it is flexible and adapts to economic uh and social cycles uh and covid is certainly one example of that uh i mean we, we at the lab we did see patterns of change when it comes to food waste, household food waste. And if you talk to the city of Ottawa, Halifax, Montreal, Calgary, they've all seen a change in the volume they, they were receiving in composting, for example. So you have to figure out a way to create mechanisms that are flexible to some of these abrupt changes. Uh, and of course, you're you're seeing, and, and of course, the model really covers the entire both ends of the food continuum. And so, this is that's why I think it's important to recognize that some of the things that are going on uh, is is key. You got food banks that are looking at, you know, externalities to reassort and redistribute, but Second Harvest actually adds value to the waste. It repurposes it, which is I think the key here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next question. The next question is coming from Rory. And Tyler, this is going back to your slide about calories, calorie consumption. Would we still need 7,400 trillion more calories if excess calorie consumption, meaning obesity, and food waste were eliminated? Yeah, so, so the World Resources Institute study that looked at this looked at a changing diet. Um, so, so that is a, in part reflected in there. It's, it is uh, important to, or we cannot underscore the impact that diet and consumption have on the food system. And one of the blessings and the curses of modern agriculture is that it has been pretty good at producing abundant, cheap, affordable food. And it has created a situation in a lot of developed countries where we eat too much. And, um, you know, we don't think about this necessarily in the food loss and waste context, but um, excess consumption is a driver of a lot of challenges that we face. Um, the solutions to excess consumption are challenging and difficult, but they certainly do have an impact where um, if you look at um, nutrient density of foods, we can afford to eat less nutrient dense foods in North America because we consume too many nutrients in general on average. Um, that's not true all of the places uh, all over the world. So if you're looking at the, the substitution, for example, between uh, a dairy milk and um, oat milk, for example, um, you know, there's this, this great example where, where we, uh, oat milk is not as nutritious for you as dairy milk is. Dairy milk is a pretty complete food, especially for children that are growing. Uh, but again, in Canada, North America, we tend to eat too many nutrients. So we can actually drink that less nutrient dense oat milk and it, it's not going to have a huge impact on us. But around the world, there are a lot of places where that isn't the case, where they still do need to rely on that, that, uh, that quality cow's milk in order to have a healthy lifestyle. So all, all this to say, you know, uh, a mo diet moderation should play a, a part of it. I'm, I'm a beef producer. I think we should eat less meat. Um, good for our uh, health, good for the environment. Um, but it is, uh, 
can it's a it's a challenge trying to influence consumers to get them to think differently ab about the food that they, they eat. Again, I'm sure Sylvain Marshall might want to mm -hmm. pick up on that. Sylvain. Yeah, I mean, basically, I, I think you. I agree with you, Tyler. Uh, I, I think there needs to be some uh, some nutritional soul searching uh, in the Western world. <laughs> I guess how we eat, what we eat. Uh, what I what I think is is exciting right now is that uh, we seem to really uh, embark into this uh, uh, journey where we'll see more. I would say protein democracy because I want I really want to focus on proteins here. Um, there's there are more choices and and frankly I think in the Western world and in particular in Canada we many of us have been raised with the idea that the meat trifecta was basically the only option we had when it came to proteins and of course dairy. Uh, but now all of a sudden we have uh, more choices, more options, which will eventually make I think our plates a little bit more sustainable as far as I'm concerned. But but so much of it, again, as Sylvain points out, is a cultural issue, right? You, I this, was just going to add yeah. that. It is. And food, right. food is culture. There's, there's yeah. no denying. I mean, that's why change is so hard and it's going to take some time. We have to be patient with ourselves. Food is culture. Food is history. So uh, it's not easy to change. But more what we're seeing in our data are more uh, is an increasing number of consumers seeing the planet on their plates there they will be influenced by some of the things that they're hearing uh, in regards to animal welfare uh, health is a big one and of course the one thing that is really becoming a main issue is the price food affordability absolutely yeah great points the next question is coming from sarah and it concerns food sustainability in the context of import and export, the fact that we're also heavily reliant on, reliant on food exports and food imports. And the question is, while trade remains important, does so-called redundant trade negatively impact sustainability? And if it does, what steps can be taken to reduce this redundancy? You know, I think, um... The role of trade in the in a in kind of the food system of the future is an interesting one. Where um, I think a lot of people like to think about you know the potential that exists with vertical farming, where we're going to be able to produce leafy greens um, all around the world, and so we will not need trade to do it. Um, but if you go back to that alternative protein discussion, you know what tends not to grow very well in a warehouse is pulse crops. You know they are crops that do well in places like the Canadian prairies. And so we're still um, going to be in a situation where there are going to be products and commodities that are going to cross international borders. Maybe we'll get to the point that they're less than what they are today, but most estim estimates are that for the foreseeable future, trade will continue to play a more impro important role. You know, the, the point that, that Sarah makes at the end around the contradictory findings regarding the sustainability of local foods really is um, an interesting challenge. If you look at, you know, the emissions from transportation, if you look at the cost of transportation, once you get something on a boat, actually it's very cheap to move it and it, and it moves with a pretty low uh, emissions profile. Um, moving things in your car is probably the most expensive and the least efficient way to move that product. That, you know, so, so people often think that just because something's been transported a long way, um, it's inherently uh, less uh, good for the environment or more expensive, but the transportation costs are can 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 play a kind of an interesting role there where again the the bigger the bulkier the transportation the more efficient it is uh, ultimately i think we'll see a future where trade will be the relief valve we talked about climate shock so we can, we can talk a lot more about the how that dynamic is going to play out and, and and this reality that we're starting to see on a much more regular basis significant threats to production and and it's less of an issue you know ukraine got a lot of attention because it is a major exporter, but probably the biggest challenge would be what happens if India has a heat wave that, that is more significant than what it experienced this year. India is a major domestic producer of food. That food, though, is all consumed domestically. We don't necessarily think about it in a global context because it never crosses a border. Um, but last year in Western Canada, 
was about a 40% decrease in our grain harvest. Uh, if India had a 30% decrease in its domestic production, that would be more than, than all Canada produces on a good year. Like, th like these are huge sums of, uh, of food that could be at stake. And so I, I think that regardless of the future that that probably falls into the category of non-redundant trade, non-redundant trade would be different maybe than, 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 than the context of, of the question. But uh, I think uh, demand around the world is already narrowing out the the redundant trade, I think we're seeing some of those pressures play out, but there's still going to need to be this, this, there's food will still need to move. Food will move because some foods like pulses grow better on the prairies in Canada. Um, and some food will need to move because we're going to need relief valves whenever domestic production is impacted around the world. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to consider the, the impact or the role that emerging technology, specifically blockchain technology is playing in this regard, in terms to the on the the movement of foods, and really talking about supply chain logistics and and blockchain, and and if that is helpful at all. But you know that's a conversation for another day. But if you want to pitch in and talk about it later this afternoon, that that's okay too. So our, our questions are piling up, and this is really good. And also towards the ending of the session, uh, I invite the participants. So meaning those joining in to open up your mics and have a, a good discussion with the panelists as well. There's another question we're closing out to Tyler. Thank you for accommodating and Sylvain, thanks for accommodating the questions as well. And this is again from Heather. It's picking up off the question that she asked before about uh, food analytics. If you remember, that's the first question that we started off the discussion segment with. And she's now wants to know in the context of energy conversion, is there any data or analytics out there on uh, the, the energy conversion ratio in our Western diet? And for example, monoculture, mechanic, mechanicized, mechanized, high-tech agriculture production methods and so on that are being aggressively exported. Is there any data in this regard? So I think if, if I'm not sure if I'm going to get this, the question right or respond to it right, but if you look at calories per acre as a measure of energy conversion, uh, corn in the United States is about as, as good as you can get uh, in turning, um, producing calories from an acre of land. Um, I think by and large, again, that's one of the problems that, that we have with our food system today is that we've gotten to be uh, extremely efficient about producing uh, calories on a small foot of land. We all probably consume too much high fructose corn syrup um, as a result of that efficiency that that we've we've built. Um, but but by and large, that Western uh, farming system of monoculture high tech ag production systems is extremely good about producing uh, energy that that way. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, uh, Sylvain, if you'd like to add anything on, on that. No, you did a great job, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Final question for, for Tyler before we move on to, to Sylvain's presentation. Uh, and this is from Clementine. And the question is, are we trying to identify what farming landscape we need to build in the near future? to meet our social, economic, and environmental goals? And if we're not doing so, why are we not doing so? Farming yeah. landscape, go ahead. So I will refer to land use and Canadian agriculture as the elephant in the room in most ag policy discussions. Uh, land use, just as, just as food is a cultural issue, how land and ag land is used is a cultural issue to farmers from one coast to the other. Like, can be very protective about how they farm the land and, and how it's used. The value of land uh, in Canada, farmland continues to increase substantially. Um, so I think the reality is we probably are not having the explicit enough discussion about what we are asking farmland in Canada to do. Um, we uh, have a project actually on this. This is a, the kind of a, a personal um, interest of mine. Again, it, it 
there's so much about getting this, the, the agricultural lands that we have in this country to, to produce food, to produce more food, to produce more food more sustainably, um, and to do it in a way where, where our agricultural land is, is expanding. But I, you know, I talked earlier, Marcia, about the 22 million acres of land that's converted to agriculture production every year around the world is a bad thing. Again, we have kind of an interesting dynamic in Canada where converting more land into agriculture production may actually be a good thing. You know, this, this, this kind of very nuanced difference between bringing more land into production in Canada compared to bringing more land into production in Indonesia or, or in South America where they're, they're taking uh, quite important, important sensitive land and converting it. Um, and so, you know, I, I think all of this together just reflects this reality of, of a very um, challenging topic um, that we probably don't spend enough time talking about. I, I agree completely, uh, Tyler. Uh, it's a uh, it's a weird it's a weird topic to address with farmers. Um, I've actually had the pleasure this morning to meet a gentleman by the name of Robert Angelic. Uh, I'm not sure. I suspect that Tyler knows who he is, but I assume that most of you don't know who he is. He is the largest farmland owner in the in the country. He uh, he owns more than a quarter of a million acres of farmland in Saskatchewan. He's got 250 uh, farmer tenants. All of them will be making a lot of money. Well, most farmers will be making a lot of money this year, but uh, his, I, his approach is a bit like the movie Moneyball. He actually optimizes the use of the land that he, that he acquires. And frankly, he empowers farmers that don't have the capital to scale up. Because if you buy machinery, you want to be as efficient as possible and basically produce as much as possible and increase yields. He's got the team to help support his tenants and it's been working very well. I think that's the biggest problem we face right now in Canada when it comes to farmland management is how do you actually help farmers scale up? How do you optimize the land that we already have? We only use five or six percent of our of our land in Canada, whereas in Holland they use over sixty percent. We have a long way to go to do better. And and I think separating uh, agriculture land for, uh, from being an investment to being a productive asset is a change in, in how people think. You know, I think like, again there was a certainly a, a generation of farmers, many still across this country, that really think about. Uh, land as a, an investment they try and get it to do both things again it's being asked yep. to do a lot but but if you think about uh, land just as a productive asset as many farmers are doing renting land probably is one of the best business decisions that you can make absolutely and and, and i'll be honest with you i mean robert angelic is one of the most hated person in farming in canada he's a non-farmer He's never farmed in his life. He's an investor. He's invested almost a billion dollars in farmland, but he's constantly criticized for not being a farmer, not having that license. And I think that paradigm shift has to happen in order to actually uh, manage farmland more sustainably in the country, in, as far as I'm concerned. And, and one of the things that's driving that paradigm shift is the value of the land itself, because uh, you, you can't... Most farmland in this country is getting to the point where it is just not viable if, if you just think about it as a productive asset. You have to think about it as an investment and you have to have the resources that, that somebody like that has or that an investment yeah. fund has. I mean, again, thinking about- Because uh, uh, farmers don't want, that, don't want their land to be worth more. Mm. They don't want yes. their land to be worth more, but that's I, not the right way to th of thinking. You're absolutely right. Yeah. But how do you get there? Well, that's, I mean, I think Robert has one model that, that's working. I, I cause his land is worth more than when, when he start, he start, he started to buy back in 2011. And since then, uh, the value of his land has actually increased dramatically because he, he's, he has opt, he has helped his tenants optimize the use of his farmland. He's producing way more. Heather has a good question. Her question is, uh, isn't that a bit circular? perhaps. Is the cost of land not rising due to over-financialization? Well, it, it depends on if you're prepared to think about land as an investment opportunity. Uh, again, that, that, that's a cultural issue. A, a lot of people don't like to think of it that way. 
yeah, I've got my own personal stake. I'm buying 100 acres next door to me. Uh, I'm paying a lot more than I would like to for it, but I but I think about it in part as an investment opportunity. That's the only way I can can justify paying these prices. When I go to sell it, hopefully many many years from now, it's going to be worth I think a lot more. You know, it is if you look at uh, commodity markets that are where scarcity drives up value, it's pretty hard to beat agricultural land around the world. There is only so much land out there. It makes it a prime candidate for institutional investing. Um, and, and again, if you, if you recognize that to farm that land, you don't actually need to own it. If you can get your head wrapped around that, it, it makes it easier because then you're less worried about the value of farmland. You're worried about the value of rent and rental prices also tend to be going up across the country. That also still is getting more expensive, but that can be more driven by the productive value of the asset rather than the value of the asset as an investment. I think uh, what motivated Heather's question, I'm just guessing here, is, uh, is, is perhaps foreign investors coming in and buy land. That's absolutely a, a critical issue, of course. And uh, I think most provinces actually do have strong regulations preventing that from happening. Uh, Robert is, lives in Saskatchewan. All of its land is in Saskatchewan. And if you were uh, elsewhere, it wouldn't be easy for him to buy Saskatchewan farmland. And and I think that's really the right approach from a policy perspective is to be protective of 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 who actually owns uh, farmland in your own country. Uh, many many countries actually have restrictive laws uh, against foreign ownership. But but I do think Marsh, it's worth um, highlighting that the probably the bigger issue, an issue that's that's more important than who owns the farmland it is how the farmland's being used. And again, as Sylvain points out, most provinces have some rules in place to ensure that farmland isn't being converted to urban land, but mm. across the country that continues to happen. Um, and, and what we need to do is be more aware of, again, we, we've got this threat of foreign ownership, but we also have the threat of uh, people in Canada like to live in suburban communities. So suburban com communities need more space. Unfortunately, a lot of that space is prime agricultural land and, and it creates a significant tension if you are trying to farm around any major community in this mm -hmm. country. On that point, Heather has a comment. She says the price of land is also a very significant issue in terms of equity and access to land for all. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, 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 absolutely. Exactly, that's exactly the point. Uh, that's when Robert comes in. Uh, for all of his 250 tenants, he did receive a phone call from farmers to scale up. So they're the ones that approach Robert because he had the capital. Yeah. And he, they knew that they were able to, uh, to uh, use their equipment much more efficiently as a result of having more acres. But they couldn't actually get to 10,000 acres because of the lack of capital. But Ro that's when Robert, a guy like Robert comes in. And he looks, he looks at farmland very differently. He, he has a, a team of agrologists. He, his, his goal is to basically get money out of the ground and get money out of the land as much as possible with numbers and data. Hmm. And, and separ separating ownership from management is a way actually to address uh, equity and inclusion because it, it makes it easier. It reduces that barrier if... Uh, we can accept that someone else can own the land. It does create an opportunity then for someone new to come in and farm the land. And again, we're seeing a, a bit of uh, that change. And again, even kind of young farmers, people that, that come from within agriculture still have a, a significant barrier getting into the business, let alone somebody that's that's new that doesn't have a, a family farm that they're trying to purchase. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that relationship of renting the land, uh, farming the land starting out that way is something that's becoming increasingly popular as a way for new people to get into it. And, and again, it, it, it can be uh, a way to encourage uh, a, a new, younger, more diverse generation of farmers in this country. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question very quickly. Uh, Kathleen wants to know, how does secession work for Angelic's tenants? Is it leased to own or similar better for future? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I raised the issue with uh, Robert this morning when I spoke to him and his tenants are, aren't interested in buying. They're interested in making money and operating uh, and, and, and run, run the best operations as possible. Land ownership is, is, is based on a partnership, a strong partnership between him. Instead of dealing with a bank, 
they deal with a private invest investor, which is Robert. I mean, whether it's FCC or, I mean, you're still dealing with uh, a lender, but in Robert's case, the thing about, the thing about banks, okay, I, I, I don't know if bankers are listening, but <laughs> this is my own point of view. When it comes to, to Tyler's point, when it comes to the operations, banks are not bad, but when it comes to the investment part of the business, they're bad. They're just not there. And Robert, that's what Robert provides to, 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 to farmers. And, and, no, sorry, please Marcia, go ahead. If I, if oh, I no, please go ahead, Tyler. Go ahead. There are, there's no such thing as the average farmer in Canada, and there's no such thing as the average farm situation. And so there will be lots of oper lots of situations where uh, a least to own situation makes sense. There will be lots of situations where where it doesn't. And uh, again, I could put, put the policy hat on. One of the one of the big issues we have in this country is trying to make a policy environment work for a very very diverse community of farms across the country where where no two farms are the same and no two situations are the same. And so if you look at succession, if you look at, at farm transfer, again, what works for one is just not gonna work for the other. And, and what we need to do is find solutions that enable a more flexible approach and that encourage many of these different tools to be used. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add that I see this working in another area, but not proper, not physical property, but more intangible property. This is what people want, investment and venture capitalist funds to promote their, 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 their work. Uh, but when we think about property, physical property, property land, there are different stakes and, and issues to be considered as well. So that's interesting. Your point about Robert, that's, that's very interesting. Okay, so now we'll move on to Sylvain. It's, it's time for your presentation. And thank you so much, Tyler, for nice. all you had to say. And it, it was such a it was such a prov provocative talk. There is it, it just opens up the floor for us to keep thinking about sustainability in our food systems. Thank you. And of course, we will have another discussion after. Sylvain, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I think Tyler will be listening in. I honestly I, I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to talk about this afternoon. Uh, I really enjoyed Tyler's presentation on sustainability. Uh, I was, I was going to, I, I am going to shift gears a little bit and, and focus more on, on logistics and, and the functionality of supply chain in general, uh, and talk about some of the things that we've seen on, in, in recent years. But I just want to make a couple of comments uh, about Tyler's presentation. Um, Honestly, I tried to find things that I I did I disagreed with, but I didn't. And so, uh, a couple of points that I thought Tyler made that are absolutely critical: productivity and efficiency, huge problem. I think I agree with him in that some of the policies that we're seeing coming out of Washington will actually give an edge to farmers in the U.S. In Canada, uh, there is this obsession to make agriculture greener and, and is there's nothing wrong with that but the other part of the equation that's missing in in my view and i think that tyler agrees with that is is this whole issue of productivity and and this is a critical issue for not only our farmers but for for the entire globe for canada or the world will need canada we saw what happened with ukraine and uh we were always one geopolitical crisis away from from seeing famine and and severe food insecurity in many parts of the world it is going to get worse before it gets better over the winter especially in light of what has happened in europe and in asia with with droughts and we're seeing what's going on in in california right now uh it's a big problem uh the other point that Tyler made that I thought was very critical is this whole issue of data deficit. We do not measure in Canada. We know we fly in the dark most of the time. Uh, as a researcher and I, I, at CAPI, they do a lot of research. It, it is unbelievably frustrating to know anything. Uh, it's it's hard. We don't have a culture of of, of data in Canada and, and it's really missing. And I think we need to do more to understand what lies ahead, understand efficiency, understand uh, there's a lot of great question from, from the audience about food waste, about food loss. And a lot of it, we just don't know for sure. And 
And if we do uh, conduct a research or a project on a specific issue, we don't really keep track. We don't necessarily provide any historical data on an issue. We kind of have to guess all the time. And, and, and tools are exist. We, at the lab, we use machine learning. We use econometrics. We use, there are so many new tools out there, uh, some great data science going on all over the country that can actually help ag. But ag is seen as a traditionalist uh, sector, let's face it. I mean, uh, a lot of farmers are jumping ahead, processors as well, but there are a lot of reluctant organizations out there that just don't want to necessarily change because what works now, you don't break it. Uh, but the problem with climate change and everything that's going on around the world is that you have to change. You don't have a choice. Um, you see, when, when you look at, supply chains the one notion that i think is often misunderstood in canada when we think about logistics and supply chain is that risks move they don't disappear they move constantly especially in light of climate change we saw that in bc and so in bc with the atmospheric rivers and the aid dome and all the stuff that has happened we're going to basically apply a bland band-aid approach fix things and then move on thinking it's never going to happen again it's we're going to make sure that that place is secure resiliency comes with the accept with with the fact that we accept that risks won't disappear. They move around all the time. It's a dynamic concept, and uh, we need to uh, we need to accept that. Uh, when it comes to trades, I mean, I really enjoyed the discussion about trades earlier. Uh, whether or not, I mean, Sarah's question is is very important. Uh, is it not? shouldn't we not focus more on food sovereignty and grow our own stuff instead of trading and buying and selling? You know, I actually think that things are already changing. Look at what's going on right now in Canada. We, we're, we're, we've, we've run out of romaine lettuce coming, coming from California. There are droughts. Uh, and so right now you have restaurants struggling to get Roman lettuce. You go to the grocery store, no Roman lettuce because we've actually capitalized on trades most of the time there's nothing wrong with trades absolutely not however things are changing california is drying up and what's happening with california we look at trades differently now look at the deal that driscoll's sign with farmers in bc and uh i see uh, tyler's head nodding there because he knows i mean driscoll's out of California, running out of water, decided to sign deals with farmers in BC and Quebec to grow strawberries all year round in, in Canada to service the cane market. And when I saw that deal, I thought, wow, trades is becoming something different. It's not just about shipping carrots and lettuce. It's about shipping intellectual property and genetics and traits. So the way we see trades is being redefined as we speak, as far as I'm concerned. It's not just about stuff. It's about research. It's about discoveries. It's about trading and exchanging knowledge. And I, I think we need to think of trades like that as well as we move forward. It's not just about you know bricks and mortar stuff and, and things we put on boats. The, that's the reality. Now, over the last three years, we, we've heard the term, oh my God, supply chains are impacted. Uh, it's costing more uh, for food and, uh, and, and all that. We've seen disruptions all over the world. The Suez Canal catastrophe. The Suez Canal was no accident, by the way. You saw a symptom of how much pressure the supply chain was under. That's basically it. And you've seen several accidents all over the world. Many trucks came into Canada with rotten vegetables and fruits because of the time it took to actually get the product into the market. And for people who don't know much about logistics, I'll give you an analogy that I hope you'll remember to understand what has happened over the last three years with COVID, okay, with, with public health measures. Say I ask you to, draw, to get into your car and drive 100 kilometers. Okay, nonstop. You'll drive 100 kilometers, you'll spend some time, you'll spend some gas, and that's it. If I ask you to do that, that 100 meters again, but stop every 10 kilometers and idle for 30 seconds, it is absolutely going to cost you more money. It's going to take you more time. 
And that was that that, that that's exactly what has happened over the last two and a half years. You, and now we're paying for it. And that's why inflation is a problem. And not only in Canada, around the world. Canada has the third lowest food inflation rate within the G7 right now. People are suffering, but we have a low inflation rate compared to other places. This is a global phenomena, but global supply chains were impacted severely by COVID. And it's going to take some time before we recover. Uh, we're recovering right now. Things are getting better. Look at uh, the LA port. The LA port is the largest container port in North America. Okay. Back in January, I think everyone saw on social media that one picture of many ships in a harbor just waiting to unload. If you remember, I remember, I mean, there were 109 vessels out there at sea waiting to unload in the port of Los Angeles. And there was panic. I mean, the president actually had to intervene. Today, in November, as we speak, there are four vessels waiting. That's it. So things are improving. Things are getting better. And even Shanghai, there are talks in China that they are going to stop uh, the uh, zero COVID policy, which is absolutely going to be helping everyone. So there's there's some really some great positive, but still we got this problem about inefficiencies and in supply chains. And the one thing that really has uh, made me thinking about the future uh, is this whole issue of of the carbon market and uh, and 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 again it goes back to Sarah's question about trades. How do we define trades? The way I see it is companies have actually looked at their global supply chain like when you put water on a table. When you put water on a table. That water will always go to the lowest point possible. Companies for many decades have actually looked at their supply chain and, and they went to the place where it was the cheapest thing, the cheapest to do anything, packaging, harvesting, transport, whatever. Okay. That's how most global food supply chains have been designed over history, recent history. But as soon as you start seeing, and I know a lot of people have an opinion on the carbon tax and how we price carbon, I actually do think that pricing carbon or a carbon market will absolutely change how we see trades as well. Because all of a sudden, and, and Tyler mentioned earlier, uh, moving, moving product on boats is the cheapest way to move product. Well, right now, uh, in a few years from now, I suspect it could change and with more policies in place. And, and that's where we're going as a country and more countries are doing the same thing. It's happening a little bit too quickly as far as I'm concerned when it comes to food. But still, I actually think it's going to change how we see uh, global food supply chains. And the one thing that, uh, that I've noticed in recent years in Canada, particularly, is that we're starting to see more processing plant. We're, we're seeing more onshoring and nearshoring in Canada. Uh, Kraft Heinz is building in Montreal. We've seen investments in Winnipeg, in Calgary, Vancouver. Uh, we're seeing some investments here in Halifax. The way that, that companies are seeing uh, how they want to service the market as I think is changing slowly. As we think about pricing carbon as a country and in and, and policy, the one thing we've never measured though, and, and this is something that I'm concerned about is how car the carbon tax is impacting food affordability for populations. We have no idea. I, I've actually asked Ottawa about that and we don't know. Going back to the data deficit that we have, we absolutely have no idea how people, people's ability to buy food is going to be impacted by a policy like the carbon tax. It's a very important policy, and I think we should pursue it. But at the same time, we need to also measure the impact of some of these policies, and we tend not to do that. I mean, Ottawa tends not to look at policies through food affordability lens, and we need to do more of that. Um, we had this issue of food labeling. I mean, this is a great group to talk about 
the front of package labeling uh, policy that was presented on June 30th of this year by the Minister of Health in a, a Ottawa grocery store, we were about to become the first country in the world to actually add a front of package labeling on, sing on a single ingredient product, ground meat. And, and that's when you see, when I saw that, I thought, my goodness, nobody has done the homework. What could possibly happen? Ground meat is likely the, mo the cheapest uh, animal protein source for Canadians. And if you are to label these products, this could actually change meat counter economics for, for Canadians. So you have to be careful. And again, you could feel that Health Canada never saw the policy. They changed their minds at the end, finally, and thank goodness. But there are some of these things that really are missing. And at the end of the day, consumers themselves, Canadians, are, are the victims eventually of, of that. The food guide, same thing. Uh, we actually looked at the pricing of, of the food guide, the new one versus the old one, and ended up realizing that for some people, the new food guide is more expensive than the old one. Depending on how you see it, that could actually drive policy down the road. Some of the reassuring things that I'm seeing, certainly when it comes to food autonomy, is our provinces really embracing the momentum that we've that we have now coming out of COVID with local, uh, with sustainability, you're seeing more and more provinces being aware. Uh, we had the pleasure to work with New Brunswick. New Brunswick, I mean, 4% of produce consumed in New Brunswick actually comes from New Brunswick, 4%, same here in Nova Scotia. Uh, people think of the Valley as a big place where they produce uh, fruits and vegetables. All of it is actually exported. So. I think there is this acute awakening around food autonomy in many provinces, which is actually going to be helpful over the long term. But food autonomy is important uh, versus food sovereignty. Food autonomy is very much about uh, producing more, processing more in an open economy. We can't possibly be efficient in Canada uh, if you only think about feeding a million or 2 million, it's impossible. You have to think about the United States and other parts of the world. And that's why I think our reasoning around food autonomy or food sovereignty has, has changed. I think people are much more realistic now today than, than before, which is really refreshing to be honest. It's because uh, for, for about a decade or so, it was, it was either this or that, but now I think there is this, this uh, notion that Perhaps we need different options and it's all about uh, the coexistence of different model, which I think is the way to go uh, in Canada. Um, yeah, it, and I'll, I'll finish on uh, talking a little bit about inflation because actually I think inflation is probably the one thing that is, it's, it's, it's our food industry's biggest concern. It's our government's biggest concern. Uh, uh, Minister Freeland mentioned, uh, mentioned it yesterday. Uh, in Parliament, uh, everyone everyone is concerned about inflation. It's putting a lot of pressure on on governments, on industry. There's a lot of tension within the industry right now. The stop sales that we're seeing, including the one that we saw in the spring between PepsiCo and Loblaws, there's been many stop sales. By the way, uh, it's it's just it's been very difficult for the food industry. And uh, the one thing that we're that I'm noticing, anyways, is is how consumers in Canada feel angry uh, in regards to what's going on with inflation. Uh, I was actually talking to a reporter from The Economist, the magazine, and she couldn't actually believe that our uh, when when the largest grocer of our country, Loblaw, when it decided to freeze prices. They were mixed reactions. A lot of people were upset. Uh, many grocers around the world have frozen their prices and, and it, there was no reaction like that. There was no negative reaction towards the grocer. What's going on in Canada is unique. And I think I think the reason why uh, many Canadians are, are upset is because I, essentially it's because of, of oversight. Uh, the Competition Bureau's role is questionable at best. I'm actually not sure if they've done a pretty good job 
reassuring the public, the bread price fixing scheme investigation is still going on after seven years. While in the U.S., uh, within months, you saw the Biden administration uh, request an investigation on meatpacking uh, only to get a report a few months later. And then GBS wrote a $56 million check in compensation to consumers to avoid a lawsuit. So you can see that things are much quicker. The unfinished business that we see in Canada, I think, is making a lot of people uh, concern about about food. But who's actually who's actually protecting the consumer? I think there's a lot of that going on. Another example happening right now: Kroger buying Albertsons. Kroger is number two in in the U.S. Albertsons is number four. Lawmakers are pushing back. There are many, many regulatory roadblocks in the U.S., and that's only to create a, a company owning 50% of market share. In Canada, you have Loblaw and Empire owning more market share, and people barely raised an eyebrow when Sobe's bought Safeway and Loblaw's bought Provigo in 1998. There's been a lot of transaction, but nobody seems to be, you know, saying anything in. The U.S. Kroger could be asked to uh, sell 375 stores and create a rival to itself because they look at options. And I think really the reason why some of these trends have gone through is is because people have the bureau has only looked at pricing, okay, and have asked parties involved: Are pricing is our prices going to go up or down as a result of the transaction? It was it was very efficiently argued all the time that prices will remain the same or drop, but nobody can predict that. Nobody. We we're in forecasting ourselves. Forecasting is hard. So I think there's a that context, that political social context, is really galvanizing politics. We saw Parliament starting investigation. And bureaucracy, we saw last week that the Bureau is going to be launching a study on, on the issue. And I think it's creating a very tense environment right now uh, with grocers, with the food industry. There's a lot of finger pointing going on. Uh, farmers are also uh, involved. And, uh, and, that, and that's, that's because of, 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 of our lack of clarity when it comes to policy and, and competition. I actually don't think that we understand the power of competition in this country, co unlike the U.S. The U.S., the Americans, they're allergic to monopolies and oligopolies. And that's why they're always after people go to jail in the U.S. In Canada, they get immunity. So I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sylvain. Uh, this, there's so much that you've said, you've touched on inflation, inflation, shipping and supply chain challenges, merger of food conglomerates uh, dealing with, with Kruger, and also interprovincial trade in the context of Quebec. And I think it was BC, which I found quite interesting. Um, there are, of course, questions in the chat. There would be. And so I'll talk about those uh, with you. And then after that, I open up the floor to anyone else who would like to join the discussion, but no more, more so in a verbal way. So unmuting your mic and, and of course, engaging with our panelists. And Tyler, feel free to, of course, respond to anything that Sylvain has said. Is there well, anything that you'd like to add right now? Yeah, I think, I think my big takeaway is that um, it's a good time to be a lawyer in ag and food law in Canada. Um, you know, and and, and I think it, it's uh, it, like like the, there's a, a, I think a lot of truth to that statement because it is an incredibly complex. Uh, the tension that exists in the system often is going to get worked out in front of the courts. One of the way that that trade is being redefined is that uh, global trade law is is changing again. If you were a a uh, lawyer that's that wanted to look at at how do we we readjust global trading rules to reflect that that. We used to have an issue with countries wanting to keep food out. Now we have an issue with countries wanting to keep food in. If you were a lawyer that wanted to look at, at competition in the food system, um, there, was, there was a lot there. You know, I think a lot of ink will get spilled over whether or not there's excess profits, but 
there's no arguing that there is significant concentration that exists in, in Canada's retail system. If you're in the regulatory space, the pressure on governments, again, Sylvain talked about the food labeling. That's just one example of, of work the government has done recently to try and uh, really turn up the pressure on the regulatory system. So again, I think it's a good time to be making this your profession. I couldn't agree more, absolutely, yeah. Thank you, okay. Let's move on to questions then. So there's one coming in from Clementine who said, would it be able, would you talk about the subsidies given to some farms in Canada? More specifically, how do you think these subsidies help non-financial, non-sustainable farms? So farms that are not financially sustainable. Uh, well, I mean, there's, yeah. <laughs> How do I tackle that one? I mean, basically, uh, every country in the world subsidizes its agriculture. I mean, that's that's the reality. And uh, is Canada doing a good job picking? I, I got to say, there's been some subsidies that, that we've given in, in agri-food that are questionable uh, because I do I do have uh, reservations when subsidies are given to to uh, operations that uh, that that only has as an objective to export. We're basically subsidizing food for other people. That that to me is a sensitive issue. And we actually just did that with Aspire in London. Uh, the, cricket, um, the cricket farm, uh, we gave money there. All of it is actually exported to Korea. Uh, there was a, there, there's a plant, uh, Canadian uh, Royal Milk in Kingston, uh, making uh, baby food to, to China. It's, it was subsidized as well. So those are some of the things that makes me concerned a little bit. But generally speaking, um, you know, subsidizing farming is is not is not a is not a, only a Canadian thing. It's happening all over the world. In fact, actually, Canada doesn't subsidize a whole lot compared to other countries, like the U.S., for example. Tyler? And, and I think yeah, I think that that last point is the important one where. Um, the value of our subsidies in Canada typically isn't enough to change the financial sustainability of a farm. A farm that's losing money is going to be out of the business. Uh, government subsidies in Canada won't save it. I mean, we, we have some issues around a crop insurance program um, that <clears throat> probably doesn't do a good enough job reflecting the actual production risk that farms face. But uh, I think when people think about this question, often they're thinking about a US context or a European context where uh, the value of the subsidies are significantly higher than they are in, in Canada. Um, I think most uh, farmers and observers in the country would say that we probably don't have a very effective suite of risk management programs. Uh, and one of the reasons why it, they aren't that effective is that they, they don't have a lot of money and a lot of the money that's in it isn't maybe used the most efficient, effective way possible. Yeah. So I, I, I think that if, you know, if you look at the kind of the premise of the question around uh, subsidies, keeping non-sustainable farms in business. I, I guess, to be honest, I like, reject the premise of that question. I don't think our subsidy programs in Canada are substantial enough to do that. I think the low point of all was to give $12 million to Loblaws for freezers. That would probably be the one thing that perhaps we could have avoided. But anyways. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I was going to say, there's also compensation for trade deals is probably a point that that uh, also <laughs> also was is uh, a little bit different, a I bit know. of kind of an asterisk around that. But our but our on our statutory our mandated business risk management programs don't do that. I know, I know, absolutely, I know. Okay. I, I was I just wanted to you know, throw it out there. <laughs> Tongue okay, in cheek. Right. Thank you. And uh, Clementine said that that question was based on things that's going on in Europe. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. It, uh, moving on to, to Heather's question, and this is going back to Sylvain, your discussion on food labeling and ground beef. What is included in determining that ground meat is cheap? Uh, well, when, when, oh, sorry, yeah, when ahead, you look excuse. at yeah, when you look at prices, retail prices, ground meat uh, as as has uh, often been the the cheapest product at, at the meat counter, uh, especially. Uh, not extra lean, but uh, just regular uh, ground meat. And and when you look at prices, when you look at different cuts and products at a meat counter, 
ground ground meat is actually quite stable. It's it's very stable, and so my concern with the label was that um, well, two things. One, you would basically uh, probably motivate grocers uh, to eliminate that option from the meat counter because. I mean, the whole, I, I'm very supportive of the front of package labeling policy because the fundamental principle of the policy is to encourage manufacturers to change formula and make products healthier for Canadians. How do you do that when you only, when you only have one single ingredient? It's impossible. And so you have to, so as a grocer, you're kind of forced to either slap a label on a product or a limited option and only sell extra lean because extra lean would have been under the threshold. But extra lean, as you know, is more expensive. And so I was very concerned uh, about the affordability of ground meat with the policy. And that's why, that's why I think the minister or Health Canada changed its mind at the last minute. And, and I think it's important to recognize that like the Heart and Stroke Foundation, for example, that was an early champion of this policy, did not ask for it to be applied to single ingredient that's products. Right. That's and right. this, this, that's, that was not the intention uh, originally. I don't know. How you know it, I don't know how it happened, really. No, I, I think I think that there's a, a, lot, a lot of questions that could be asked about, uh, you know, <laughs> regulatory decision making in, on Ottawa these days. But, <laughs> but, but, but Heather touched on the point around full cost accounting, and I think it goes back to Sylvain's point earlier about the lack of, of data. And we really don't, um, on, on many of the issues she talks about, you know, environmental health and, and climate impacts of food, we don't have a great understanding. I think beef's got, got a negative environmental rap that it doesn't deserve in Canada from an environmental perspective. Like a lot of people hear, hear a lot about methane and, and they, they think it's a big deal. The, the bigger issue probably globally from beef is actually uh, deforestation and, and land use changes that it's, that it's driving in other parts of the world as uh, land gets put into pasture use. Uh, mm -hmm. Methane by and large is, is, mm -hmm. is a short-term beef as, as, as long as your cattle herd is not growing and certainly in Canada it's not um, and and most places around the world it's not um, the, the environmental impact of that methane is not as significant as it is in other places if you look at the change in GHG emissions in eastern Canada in particular over the last 20 years if you look at the the farmland impact actually the loss of pasture and hayland has resulted in more GHG emissions and and so we we often forget about the the positive environmental impact that the cattle bring. If you look at the government's recent methane uh, strategy, they, they acknowledged that they, they did not set targets for methane reduction from agriculture, largely because, again, this is a, a, an extremely complex relationship between cattle and, and the ecosystem that they live in. And, and so the environmental impact in beef again, is not all created equal. Uh, beef coming out of uh, Brazil in particular can have significant impact, but that's often because of deforestation, not because of the methane from cattle. There are ways that we can address the methane issue. It's back to regulations in Canada. We don't have a regulatory system that makes it easy to add feed additives. We need to fix that, but there's there's solutions that are out there. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. And it's and it's, it's it's misunderstood. And right now, it's it's uh, there's there's a bit of a game uh, of uh, of who's noisier, like who and 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 it's lost it's lost often. And uh, and we're seeing that in ag a lot with fertilizer use with uh, cattle. There are there are several um, there are several battles right now that uh, that really it's all about who makes the most noise. Unfortunately, and we're not trying to understand the issue at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is such a, a great discussion that we could actually go on further with. Now I'd like to open up the floor. To, to anyone who wants to speak. And I know Heather had her, uh, her hand up and Rory had a question as well. So if Heather could please unmute your mic and pose your comment or your question. Let's let Rory go ahead. Thank you, Marcia, because I think I've said enough already. No, no, your, your comments are, are really great. Tyler, Rory, go ahead. Well, thanks, uh, Marcia. Well, my question's there in the chat. It's about meat alternatives. Uh, Sylvain or Tyler, you know, the market seems to have gone sideways for these items. Obviously, they were introduced at a high price point, but
But now when you look at them relative to uh, meat, you know, meats shot up a lot. They don't look relatively as expensive perhaps as they once did, but the demand seems to have really flattened. Um, I'm just wondering why you think that is and what are the implications, you know, when we had so much sort of belief these new alternatives would drive a, you know, a healthier diet and more sustainable food system? You know, worried is it's a good question. We actually just uh, released a report, well, just released about two months ago. We actually compared um, meat products uh, versus uh, meat analogs throughout the country in Canada. Uh, meat analogs are still about 38, 40% more expensive. That's one reason. I mean, these products are still very expensive, despite the fact that we're seeing more competition, there's more supply. And so that begs the question, what is going on there? And the other issue, of course, is it goes back to the legacy of, uh, I would say, the Beyond Meat invasion, wanting to replace something, replace beef, better than beef. And I think that was a big mistake from the campaign. Uh, I was glad to see new products at the meat counter, but if you're basically selling something that actually looks like the classic, the product tastes like the product, why would you pay 40% more, you know? And, and so I think the business case for consumers uh, has, been, has been somewhat weak. There are great products out there, but I think, I think that price point has been an issue and will continue to be, to be an issue. In food service, things are still uh, going well. I mean, I, I think that sales are actually quite robust in retail, different story. And, and I think it's important to separate, you know, the hype that existed for a relatively short period of time from the long-term trends that exist in the space. You know, uh, alternative meat products didn't get invented when Beyond Meat came. Uh, what they seemed to invent were these very ambitious claims as Silvesas to replace meat and to try and do it in a relatively short time frame. So what we know is that there is that, that long-term trend has existed. The number of vegetarians in Canada is going up. The number of vegetarians around the world or in the developed world largely seems to be, be, be increasing. And so that trend towards meat alternatives will likely continue, but it's probably not going to continue at the rate that some people were claiming that it would uh, two years ago. And again, so I, I think it's, you know, there was this, this incredible hype in, that kind of this this uh, balloon that got burst. Um, that's that's different from kind of the long term trends that exist in the marketplace. And I don't mm -hmm. think it's going to go not going to go away, but it's just not going to be all of the great things that, that people claimed it to claim for it mm -hmm. to be. Heather, thank you, Tyler. Heather, Heather, you have a question. And then okay. uh, so sorry, Sylvain needs to. Uh, unfortunately leave right at uh, yeah it's yeah. a very long day I guess that just comes back to my earlier questions is when we say that they they're not what is how does that price get on the product right the cost of beef versus the cost of um of the beyond meat burger or the cost of sustainably produced chicken versus the cost of chicken in the grocery store so the cost of <coughs> excuse me of industrially produced chicken that you can find at Costco or Walmart, the, the environmental costs, the, the labor injustice costs, the health costs, apparently uh, my local butcher was saying that often that chicken is full of water. So the weight comparator is actually not even the same. And so I, I'm interested in how do those numbers get on the price tags of these products for consumers to compare because they're, they're nowhere near a full cost accounting um, of, of what's happening. And I think that that's unjust because it has unjust effects on producers and it actually drives what is going to be bought, which drives what's going to be produced, which has environmental implications, health implications, and social justice implications. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I actually, I, I, you know, uh, when it comes to, uh, again, <clears throat> I'm going to go back to the carbon tax. I, I think it's really... And this is something, if there is one study that we need to do is, is to assess exactly how the carbon tax is impacting all nodes of the supply chain, especially the consumer. We don't, we don't know, but I do believe that it is impacting choice. It, it is impacting the economics of all the nodes within the supply chain. And, and, it will, and so the price tag that you'll see at the grocery store will start to slowly reflect the actual costs of, of, of carbon uh, 
emitted to produce whatever product you're you're buying as far as i'm concerned over time thank you thank you are there any other questions unfortunately sylvain has to I'm, to leave i'm really sorry <laughs> yes, it's, uh, my it's it's dinner time here so we and we have guests upstairs so i have to go <laughs> sorry thank you very right. much for for all Take care, Tyler. It was, it was great talking you. to you Take care. Thank you, Sylvain. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Are there any, we're, we're, we've actually come to the end of our panel for today, but if there are any questions that you'd like to pose to Tyler, uh, last minute questions or any comments, we of course welcome them right now. No more questions, no more comments. Tyler, you have the last word. Is there anything you'd like to share with the audience before you leave? No, I just really appreciate the questions. Again, I think, uh, as I said earlier, the legal landscape around agriculture and food uh, is evolving in this country. And I think that you're all in a really interesting place. So I, I hope that the rest of your conference goes well and, um, and uh, really appreciated the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Tyler. And we, we hope to see you tomorrow and uh, in Sunday as well when we close. Yeah. Tomorrow is the Thank final you. day, sorry. Tomorrow is the fifth, tomorrow. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. It's been a, a long day and we hope the panel was an interesting one and we hope to see you tomorrow. All the best. <laughs>